No androids allowed, huh? Why don't I just be a little deviant here? Find Lieutenant Anderson. This is Connor, by the way, for those who don't know. Lieutenant Anderson. Shit, I thought androids weren't allowed in here. How do you know I'm an android, sir? Derek Myers, born May 7th, 1989. Security guard, criminal record, none. Jonah Graham, criminal record none, born December 9th, 1987, unemployed. Edward Dempsey, born February 8th, 1995. Hey, February 8th, that's the day before me. Administrator, criminal record, none. Oh my God, I would be five years older than this man in this world. That feels weird. Bartender's not going to be him, right? Jimmy Peterson, born February 1st, 2001. Business owner, criminal record, none. Christopher Gray, June 18th, 1983. Unemployed, criminal record, DUI. Who's this guy? Lieutenant Hank Anderson, born September 6, 1985, police lieutenant, criminal record none. Hey. Introduce yourself. I want to do some more profiling real quick. Let's be cool. Johan Kim, born 11-10-99, delivery driver, currently unemployed, criminal record, domestic abuse. Chris Roberts, unemployed, criminal record none, May 16th, 1998. May 16th is my mom's birthday. I don't really get a sense that time is of the essence here, so. Let's just, uh, let's do some exploring. Dennis Ward, born June 11th, 1982, accountant, currently unemployed, criminal record, narcotic, narcotic supplier. Samuel McRae, April 10th, 2012, Docker, no criminal record. Hey, get out of here. 31% unemployment rate, when will it stop? Jeez. Androids killed our country. I don't get a sense that I'm welcome here. Lieutenant Anderson, you looking? My name is Connor. I'm the android sent by Cyberlife. I looked for you at the station, but nobody knew where you were. They said you were probably having a drink nearby. I was lucky to find you at the fifth bar. What do you want? You were assigned a case early this evening. A homicide involving a Cyberlife android. In accordance with procedure, the company has allocated a specialized model to assist investigators. Well, I don't need any assistance. Especially not from a plastic asshole like you. Just be a good little robot and get the fuck out of here. Listen, I think you should stop drinking and come with me. It'll make life easier for both of us. I understand that some people are not comfortable presence of androids but I, I am perfectly comfortable now back off before I crush you like an empty beer can I apologize lieutenant I didn't mean to bother you I'll wait for you outside take your time 
Would you say homicide? Okie dokie. Uh, not a ton to say here because I don't really know Hank, but it's, we'll do a little bit of profiling here. So based on this, it sounds like Hank is known for his drinking. So much so that people thought that that's probably where he would be. Seems we're right. Now, Hank obviously has some kind of history with androids, one that does not facilitate goodwill toward them. And it seems to me that if I was to approach Hank with anything other than like neutrality and even a little bit of some un like some empathy as best an android could drum it up, that he's likely to be hostile toward me just based on those vibes. Not to mention I have no idea how many drinks he's had. So if he already possesses some level of judgment toward androids and he's been drinking, now his inhibitions are lowered. There's a chance maybe he could be more aggressive or perhaps uh, just not really take to me in a particularly well good way because he's going to experience the emotion of seeing me a little bit more raw. So when he says I'm perfectly comfortable and tells me that I'm wrong, that I have not hit his experience, it's important for me to back off there instead of double down. So me saying I'm going to go outside I think is the best option there because it shows that I'm reading him and respecting what it is that he has to say and I'm going to distance a little bit from him I think if I spill his drink that's way too aggressive if I buy him another one and I need him to be with me I don't really need an intoxicated Hank with me so showing respect for his boundary there I think is the best course of action and it seems to have worked because his interest was piqued and now he's following. Seems pretty self-explanatory. You wait here. My instructions are to accompany you to the crime scene, Lieutenant. Listen, I don't give a fuck about your instructions. I told you to wait here, so you shut the fuck up and you wait here. Josh Douglas from Channel 16, can you confirm that this is a homicide? I'm not confirming anything. Oh boy. Um I want to respect him, but I I got to do it. He'll get over it. I sat for a little while. I'm just going to be nice and chill. I'm not going to make myself Conspicuous to anybody. Shit. Androids are not permitted beyond this point. It's with me. What part of staying in the car didn't you understand? Your order contradicted my instructions, Lieutenant. You don't talk, you don't touch anything, and you stay out of my way. Got it? Got it. Evening, Hank. We were starting to think you weren't going to show. Yeah, that was the plan till this asshole found me. So yourself an android, huh? Oh, very funny. Just tell me what happened. We had a call around 8 from the landlord. The tenant hadn't paid his rent for a few months, so he thought he'd drop by, see what was going on. That was when he found the bar. A, a quick note about Hank. It's interesting to me that he set a boundary there and then was willing to back off of it. Particularly when I have said that this is my directive. It seems to me that despite not liking me because I'm an android, there is something about Hank that respects my protocols. And it almost makes me wonder if Hank knows what he's working with. 
as it relates to an Android, that this isn't his first foray into having an Android around him. Because every time I reassert, this is what my protocol dictates, he doesn't really argue. I mean, he might say like, fuck your protocol, but he's not saying like, get your ass back in the car. He's like, all right, fine, come with me and here's some secondary boundaries that come along with whatever it is you're going to do. If you're like, I recognize as an Android, you're going to persist based on your directive. It's just, it, so if I'm reading Hank, I'm thinking, okay, so this is a guy that probably is more conflicted about his boundaries with Androids than he's letting on because he's sending mixed messages through setting boundaries, but also allowing me to break through them. And you can get a lot of insight into where people are at with things sometimes based on their boundaries and whatever consequences they're willing to hold or uphold or hold or not hold as it relates to that boundary that was set. So just kind of trying to get a little bit of a read on Hank here, because if I'm going to be working with him, I need to, I need to understand the flow of his relational dynamic to me. It was even worse before we opened the windows. The victim's name's Carlos Ortiz. Oh, wow. He has a record for theft and aggravated assault. According to the neighbors, he was kind of a loner stayed inside most of the time they hardly ever saw him. Oh, stayed easy and wasn't worth calling everybody out in the middle of the night. Could have waited till morning. I'd say he's been there for a good three weeks. We'll know more when the coroner gets here. There's a kitchen knife over here. Probably the murder weapon. Any sign of a break-in? Nope. The landlord said the front door was locked from the inside. All the windows were boarded up. The killer must have gone out the back way. What do we know about his android? Not much. The neighbors confirmed he had one, but it wasn't here when we arrived. Well, I, I gotta get some air. Make yourself at home. I'll be outside if you need me. I am alive. All right, review evidence. Each letter is perfect. It's way too neat. No human rights like this. Chris, was this written in the victim's blood? I would say so. We're taking samples for analysis. All right, let's see what we got here. Red ice. Okay, so this guy was on the same type of drug that we saw Todd on. Carlos Ortiz, height 5'6", weight 286, estimated time of death 11.30 p.m. 28 stab wounds, deceased more than 19 days ago. Fingerprints, database match, Carlos Ortiz, criminal record, theft and aggravated assault. All right, reconstruct. Victim fell here. Victim was stabbed. They came from the kitchen. Okay, so the idea is that, so he was just, looks like he was just chilling, doing his thing. Android approaches. He backs up. He's running away. Android is Michael Myersing his way toward the man. Hits him in the stomach. Maybe for the first time. Guy is hurt. Crawls. Gets over the chair. Oh my god. This thing is just pure Michael Myers. This thing hits him again. He falls down. Androids repeatedly stabbing. So this tells me that the android is super angry. I mean, if this was a human, we would look at this as basically him being completely flooded to the point like like his this is about more than whatever the moment leading up until this was. This is this is personal. People don't generally do this 
unless there's some additional motive here that's been building up for a long time. So this isn't about some squabble they had. This is very much going to be some sort of long-term long vendetta, maybe, that this android had toward this moment. He was stabbed 28 times. Yeah. Seems like the killer really had it in for him. Regular letters, font, Cyberlife Sands. Oh, Jesus, what the hell are you doing? I'm analyzing the blood. I can check samples in real time. I'm sorry. I should have warned you. Okay, just don't put any more evidence in your mouth. You got it? Got it. Hank, he's not... <sighs> Fucking hell, I can't believe this He's shit. not a human! He's not a human! This is perfectly reasonable for Connor to put it in his mouth. He's an android. Get over it, Hank. Red ice. Seems. All right, what do we got? Carlos liked to party. Chris, I want full analysis on the narcotics. Consider it done, Lieutenant. All right. Victim used drugs. Seems to be pretty obvious. No fingerprints. Android involvement. I guess if androids don't have fingerprints, that would make sense. That would surprise me if androids didn't hey Mike, have fingerprints. Mike, you finished taking samples there? Yeah, that's it. Dried blood. We realize that that's probably from when he was stabbed right there. Eden Club, come visit us. Seems like the majority of this is going to be in the kitchen. Dried blood on the wall. My God, come on. These controls are a little wonky. Fingerprints. Carlos Ortiz. Signs of a struggle. Makes sense. Gossips Weekly. Judy Hewitt shows off her new beach bod. Android sex officially better. Sorry, ladies, but plastic can't be beat. Mark Water and Nancy Reese step out together. The result of our survey is in, and it's official. 68% of men prefer sex with an android to a real woman. And 52% of men saying they're tired of the ex they've tried the experience at least once, and that's a lot of android love to go around. There were a few reasons given for this preference, but we think we know the real reason. Androids don't want to talk about their feelings afterwards. This story sponsored by Eden Clum. Discretion is our middle name. You know who's more likely to talk about their feelings after sex? Men. Men are. So my guess is that this is less about the android wanting to talk about feelings and maybe the fact that men... I, I mean, I, I don't know, man. Men, men have a tendency to talk more about feelings after sex because, in a lot of ways, men are conditioned to see sex as the suitable point of connection. 
And I'm not just talking about heterosexual sex. I'm talking about sex in general. Men are conditioned not to talk about their feelings so much as to show their connection through sex. And so when you get into the refractory period and you feel that closeness, there's a little bit more of an openness to vulnerability that it's like the one socially acceptable time that men are allowed to express themselves. Allowed, meaning like conditioned to believe is when they can open up. So the fact that the fact that they would hypothesize that androids not wanting to talk about their feelings afterwards is what makes them better than having sex with a human is ridiculous. I mean, I, although we are also making the assumption that this is mostly, I mean, I guess they're saying they're surveying men here, but like, honestly, it could be that the women want it, would want to have sex with the androids because men want to talk about their emotions after. I don't know. I just like, I hate how overly gendered that is, but Again, this is written by somebody who owns a strip club, not some sort of scientific researcher. And they're just basically saying, screw the data. Here's what we think. Yeah. All right. Tech addict. New app plus headset allows for live translation of all languages. Is your Android spying on you? CyberLife could be using its Androids to collect private information. Zero gravity subway to connect NYC to DC in 45 minutes. It's an ad for Sex Club with Androids. Exactly. Anything that starts with sorry, ladies, is automatically garbage. Agreed. More and more experts are suggesting that CyberLife uses its 120 million androids. 120 million androids? To record details of private conversations of its customers and sell them to trading partners. Ever talked about buying that new car while eating dinner with your partner? CyberLife could use that information for targeted advertising. The information goldmine doesn't stop there. Everything from personal indiscretions to political affiliations could easily be extracted and potentially used for nefarious purposes. The state, the spate of reports linking Warren's presidency to CyberLife only deepens such concerns. Several consumer rights organizations have requested that CyberLife disclose the information it gathers and who it sells that information to, but the company has always refused. Requests for a formal inquiry have gone unanswered so far. Yikes. All right, knife missing. Baseball bat. Fingerprints of Ortiz. Pause violent impact traces of Ethereum. So wait, was the android acting in self-defense, potentially? Deviant took a knife. Well, wait a second. That is a pose that says, please don't hit me. Like, like look who's Michael Myersing now. Deviant was attacked. Emotional shock. Okay, so the Deviant obviously did or said something. Mr. Ortiz says, Miguel Cabrera is my favorite Detroit Tiger ever and hits the android, which is super uncool. Hits the android again. Three times. Android says, you know what? You see this? So this would be an interesting moment. I wonder if this is a moment where the Android decided, you know what? No. And says, I'm going to act in self-defense, which I don't know what kind of protocol it has. Guy goes for the fourth shot. Look at that. He's really just he's going for the home run here. Android says, nope, because if it's a machine, it can calculate better. Dude gets slashed, falls into the table. Android starts coming at him. More 
dried blood. from the inside. Killer must have gone out this way. There are no footprints apart from Officer Collins' size 10 shoes. Well, this happened weeks ago. The tracks could have faded. No. This type of soil would retain a trace. Nobody's been out here for a long time. So it seems to me like Hank's judgment of androids is precluding him from seeing the utility and having an android around. You can see, you kind of see that's like in his like face, right? Like I wouldn't be surprised if a guy like Hank is worried that an android like Connor has the potential to take his job. So he's seeing Connor's knowledge and acumen as a threat and is overcompensating that by trying to assert that there's something about him that's maybe able to perceive something that the adroid isn't. And when Connor makes his case with fact, we see that kind of scramble Hank up here. So there's probably lots of dissonance going on here. Like, who's this android that's able to perceive things more efficiently and accurately than I am. And what does that mean for me? All right, so what other evidence? There's there's one more piece of evidence I'm guessing that we're looking for. Let's go see if we can find it. Whoa. Obsessive writing. R A nine. Okay, but R A nine is not written in Android handwriting. So was that written potentially by Carlos? Like, that's not the same font that we saw out there. Also, that's one hell of a window to have in your bathroom. Can I just, can I just point this out really quick? What a, what a crazy window to have. A little intrusive, don't you think? All right, let's see, let's go see what we got. Hank, where are you, brother? Lieutenant, I think I figured out what happened. Oh yeah. Shoot, I'm all ears. It all started in the kitchen. There are obvious signs of a struggle. The question is, what exactly happened here? I think the victim attacked the android with the bat. That lines up with the evidence. Go on. Android stabbed the victim. So the android was trying to defend itself, right? Okay, then what happened? The victim fled to the living room. to get away from the android. 
All right, that makes sense. The android murdered the victim with the knife. Okay. Your theory's not totally ridiculous. But it doesn't tell us where the android went. It was damaged by the bat and lost some therium. Lost some what? Therium. You call it blue blood. It's the fluid that powers androids' biocomponents. It evaporates after a few hours and becomes invisible to the naked eye. Oh. But I bet you can still see it, can't you? Correct. Yeah. So, I find it interesting that Connor seems to be invested in getting Hank's approval. Which seems to me like it would be a good idea. Because if we go with the theory that Hank needs to be useful and have utility in these moments, Connor would definitely want to show Hank that he knows what's going on while also passively reinforcing for Hank that he knows better. So I actually applaud Connor for the way that he went about that because if that's... It, we want Hank to feel like he matters in this investigation or else he's not going to work with us. It's the old adage of you can get a man to do anything if you make it if you make him think it's his idea. We're kind of doing that to Hank right now. All right, so we got Ethereum on the ground here. Mikachu, thank you so much for the host. Trail goes through the hallway. A ladder was used. So blue tracks in the bathroom. Find something to climb. Chair seems like it would be useful. Chair. I'm going to check something. Just chill, Hank. Come with me. Uh, go check something. a doll like that in their attic. Oh, shit. That mannequin moved.
was just defending myself. He was gonna kill me. I'm begging you. Don't tell him. Connor, what the fuck is going on up there? It's here, Lieutenant! Oh, shit. Chris! Ben! Get your asses in here now! Interesting. Uh, guilty conscience much? Now, if we are to understand that Deviance is a android acting on its own volition, it feels things and then says, I'm going to do something with that, whether with protocol or against. I find it interesting that the android then immediately confessed when Connor found it. That's a whole other story. I'm going to use this as an example of how silence can be really powerful. When Connor shows up, he stays he stays quiet. He stays unaffected. And there's not a ton of time that that passes. But because Connor doesn't immediately say something, it provides the deviant android the opportunity to say something. And this is why silence is so important when people get arrested, for example. Because the android essentially implicates itself in that moment to Connor perhaps out of guilt or recognition that what it did was in violation of its protocol and it has the ability to anticipate consequences. So it just gives it to us in part because Connor stays so stoic. What happens when people are quiet is people tend to project their insecurities on people who are silent because since a person who's silent doesn't say what they're thinking and how they're feeling about a certain situation it's left up to our brains to interpret that person's silence. And we often do that through projection. So silence is a super useful tool for Connor here because the deviant sees Connor and automatically assumes that the that Connor sees him however he sees himself right now. Instead of asking Connor, what are you doing here? He could take power in that moment by asking Connor what he's doing, but instead he sees Connor's silence is powerful and then just throws all his insecurities onto Connor and spills the beans. Silence is powerful. It's why it's why silent people tend to make others uncomfortable and why people perceive those in, as being silent as having more power in a room. Because if, you, if that silence exists long enough, we start to take our own perceptions and ideas and values and we throw it into that person because they're not giving us anything works great on kids too by the way if kids have a guilty conscience and you stay silent and you just kind of don't react kids will let it out but people will fill silence so use power use use silence as your weapon for I don't have much else to analyze beyond that um, other than it seems that maybe we're going to get into Hank's good graces because we managed to find this now, before we go into this next section, I just want to say, as a heads up, uh, the next the next section might be a fair bit distressing, and so you've been warned. If you need to walk away, please do that. I'm also going to use this as an opportunity to say that I appreciate y'all being here. If you're watching me live, thanks for popping by, for chatting, lurking, or watching the VOD on Twitch. If you're watching the VOD on YouTube, I appreciate so much you taking the time to watch the VOD. I hope you've liked and subscribed by now. Best way you can support the stream is to share it with folks. 
But yes, uh, therapists use silence effectively all the time. The best therapists know when to speak and when not to. And I would argue that that extends into social situations. People who are social, more socially adept, so to speak, tend to know how to use silence and how to use their voice. You will find that you can carry a lot more power in a interactional setting if you're willing to be silent a bit. People will start talking if you don't fill the space for them. All right, here we go. Todd. Oh. Dinner is ready. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming. All right, serve food. Is he going about this? You about to do more drugs? Oh boy. Him using drugs like this in the presence of his daughter. By the way, people use drugs because they feel good. People also use drugs because they want to get away from what it feels like to not be on drugs. That's what creates a horrible cycle beyond just the addictive properties of whatever it is. Todd is very clearly using those drugs as a way to escape this. And my guess is that when Todd becomes sober again, the next hit is what he's chasing because it's miserable to not be high. A very complex thing. So, uh, in a lot of ways, it makes sense why he's using drugs, but it's what makes drugs so scary because they feel good. People don't do drugs because they feel terrible. People do drugs because they will make you forget what's going on. It will take you out of reality. You'll feel like you're on cloud nine for however long the trip is. And then you crash down and you see the reality of it relative to what you experienced when you were high. You're absolutely going to keep chasing that. And this is why working with folks who are abusing substances and are struggling with addiction, whether psychological or biological, is such difficult work because it's complex. It's not just stop taking drugs. It's we have to really figure out where the drug use is coming from. And what's happening when you're off of it? It's a relationship to drugs. Like drugs can be conceptualized as another relationship in a in a system. There wasn't much in the kitchen. That affects other people. I did what I could. Ooh, probably shouldn't have said that, Cara. Kara saying that to Todd is a terrible idea because any sort of language that Todd is going to read as a confirmation of his own self-loathing, in this case, there wasn't much in the kitchen, which reflects to Todd, I'm not able to provide, is, is potentially inflammatory to Todd. I'm not saying we have to coddle Todd, but we also have a child involved, and Todd is currently high, which probably means that his inhibitions are down. So Kara needs to be more mindful here of what she says, because that's absolutely a potential impetus to Todd getting really aggressive, because to this point, we have not seen Todd be particularly good at managing his emotional experience. So I'm a little freaked out now because Kara just said that. Because she's trapped in this situation. Life. 
life's funny. I lost my job because of androids. And I need somebody to take care of this goddamn house. What do I do? I go out and hire a fucking android. What a joke. Of course, androids are so fucking wonderful. They never fail. They never tired. They never sad. They're so fucking perfect, they ruined my fucking life! You, Rina. What's your fucking problem? Not the life you dreamed of, eh? Maybe you think this is easy. Maybe you think it's my fault we live in this fucking shithole. My fault your fucking mother took off! You should stop taking drugs, Todd. Sometimes you really scare me, Todd. Fucking bitch took off without a word. Fucking whore walked out on me for a fucking accountant! It's all your fault. Daddy, no! It's all your fucking fault! Here. Come back here? Come back here right now! It's all her fault. I know it's her fault. You stay there. Don't you dare fucking move, or I'll bust you worse than last time. Real quick, because I'm sure that was probably pretty intense for some folks in chat. I want us to just take a second and breathe. This is a video game, so we're going to breathe. I know that, you know, if you're here for the narrative, we'll, we'll get there in a second. But I just want to take a second and breathe, kind of help relax just a second, because it's pretty intense. Um, this is a very realistic depiction of abuse, man. It really is. It It's... Todd is taking all the insecurities that he has, all of his self-loathing, every every narrative he's created in relation to his life. And he is asserting power in a place that he can't. I am not excusing Todd for hitting Alice at all. I, I Abuse is never okay, ever, no matter how explainable it is. But I do think it's important for us to look at this this way. Todd is not actually hitting Alice. Todd's hitting himself. Because the thing is, when projection gets strong enough, you start to not even be able to differentiate yourself from who you're projecting it onto. So Todd's high, which doesn't help, and he looks at all of his incompetence, the recognition that what he's the choices he's making to do drugs and stuff are his fault, the fact that he heard that from his wife, who left him. He takes all of it and he projects it to Alice, who is relatively benign and neutral. And then because he's high and because he's so inflamed by his emotional experience, now it's kind of like he's looking in the mirror. And the self-loathing there is, hmm, I just hit myself. Last time he got aggressive with Alice, he made the recognition that it wasn't in fact him, it was his daughter that he re-recognized to some extent that projection. This time he didn't, because now his inhibitions are there. He's inhib uninhibited. So he's, he's taking his aggression out on something that he can manipulate and hold power over because he's perceiving the world as having power over him. 
most abusers, if you get into a space where you can question them and you can talk to them and you can get them to be vulnerable, are going to tell you that the majority of the time they feel scared, they feel boxed in, they feel judged, and that they feel as if they are completely out of control. And so abuse is an overcompensation for that. It's, a, it's not okay. It's not appropriate. It's problematic. You need to hold folks accountable to that. But it comes from a painful place. Todd has lost everything. Alice is an innocent bystander here who is the victim of the abuse. And if you're Alice here, why this is so painful to watch and why abuse in childhood is so horrible is because Alice does not understand any of what I just said. What Alice is going to hear as a child, developmentally, is this person who takes care of me is telling me what I think and feel. And if I don't feel like he's a screw-up, am I wrong? Is Todd right? Do I think he's a screw-up? Is he actually a screw-up? Is it my fault that he's a screw-up? If he's going to hit me, it must be. It must be my fault that daddy's unhappy. It must be my fault that, that mommy left daddy and is no longer here. And that kid, Alice in this case, is going to ingrain that so deeply And is going to carry that with her unless she gets evidence to the contrary. And this is what creates something like disorganized attachment. A person who is consistent and reliable, and I don't even know that Todd is consistent and reliable in this case. I'd, I'd argue he's not. But also creates harm. What Alice is going to learn is, this man does not meet my needs. Kara does to an extent, but when Kara meets my needs, she gets hurt. I don't want Kara to get hurt, so I'm not going to express my needs. Because if I express my needs to Kara and she does it wrong, she's going to get hurt. That's my fault. So Alice learns, I have to make, I have to meet my own needs. I have to make my own blanket fort. Maybe I have to eat my own food. I have to stay very quiet. I have to calm myself down. I have to make sure that at any given point in time, I am not inflammatory to my dad. And when my needs need to be met, it doesn't even matter if Todd's are. So I got to rely on me. which leads to a dismissive attachment down the line. Alice, as a child, is going to overcompensate with control by running away, by keeping distance. But when she becomes an adult and then has to reconcile her need for relationships and connection with the fact that those have never been reliable for her, it's going to make it inc incredibly hard to engage in an adult relationship, in a lot of ways by no fault of her own. So the ripple effect that abuse has in childhood from caregivers in particular is immense. Absolutely immense. And it's what makes it so profoundly sad and heartbreaking and why we do the best we can to try to protect children from abuse. Abuse towards adults isn't cool either. Don't get me wrong. That's, that's also terrible. I'm not trying to compare like traumas and abuse and violence. But in this moment, we're seeing this is a really beautifully represented situation of abuse. And I don't mean beautiful in a really good way. I mean beautiful just in, it's very accurate. So we can understand where Todd is coming from. We can understand why he's doing this. We also need to hold him accountable for that. And then we also can know the long-term implications and the short-term implications of Alice. Alice runs upstairs. She creates separation. Thank God Todd doesn't run after her. Now, we are in a really horrible space because now I have to make a decision. Do I follow my protocol as an android and stay put like Todd said in order to try to de-escalate the situation? Or do I potentially inflame Todd by moving? And now he's alluded to the fact that he destroyed me before which corroborates the drawing we saw in Alice's toy box. This is an impossible situation. Todd has even 
So Todd didn't even have to lay his hands on Kara to exert control of the situation. The threat of violence is in and of itself abusive because it becomes manipulative of a person because they have to start making decisions to orient themselves in such a way that they do not get harmed by a person who has threatened it. And if you've seen representations of Todd doing these things, you are well within your right to try to protect yourself as best you can. This is a terrifying situation for a person to be in. Absolutely terrible. So I just, I wanted to make sure that I stopped us here and talked through what was going on because this gets, I mean, I, I don't come from an abusive household. This still, this, this, this shakes me every time I see this scene because it's, it's terrible that this happens, but it happens all the time. How can Alice recover from this? It's going to take a lot of work. She needs somebody reliable. I mean, I I would make the argument at this point that Todd needs to figure out a way to get clean. I'm not entirely sure why Alice isn't with her mother. That surprises me. I might make an argument that Todd's mother leaving, or that Alice's mother leaving without taking her with is also neglectful because she's now left Alice in the full custody of a person who's using drugs and has, has hit her, and we just witnessed it. This is absolutely reportable. Him using drugs in the same room as his daughter is reportable. Him using drugs and then hitting his daughter? That's an investigation and a half. So... Uh, there's some real structural change in the family that needs to happen in order for Alice to be... I mean, I, we don't know that Alice is damaged goods per se, but it is going to be very hard for Alice to engage if she doesn't find a meaningful relationship in her life that can take care of her stat. The hope would be that that could be Todd. The hope would be that Todd would do the work, that Todd could go through rehab, that Todd could find himself in it to reconcile it, and that Todd could work his ass off to try to rebuild trust with Alice. Alice doesn't owe Todd trust but he absolutely it's on him to work his ass off that's the ideal if Todd can't bring himself to do that then yeah we got to find somebody else for Alice to facilitate that and Todd Todd maybe does want that like that's the thing right like this is what drugs do to folks too there's a good chance that Todd does want that but Todd's own self-loathing is getting in the way of him doing that Todd probably Todd I think Todd wants to provide I think Todd wants Alice to have everything that she wants he wants to be the guy that can do that for her. But circumstances and choices that he's making is contributing to the antithesis of that. And that is leading to self-loathing. When people don't care, people become apathetic. People don't engage this way and become abusive if they don't care, if they're not emotionally stimulated by something. So I really do believe that Todd cares, but he's not orienting himself to it properly. He's doing it in an abusive way. This is not excusing Todd's behavior, but this is, as a therapist, this is how you have to view these things. I can't view Todd as an irredeemable piece of shit. That's not fair to Todd. That is That takes out all of the context that leads up to this point where Todd makes this decision to do this. And that is not fair to Todd. Writing Todd off continues to fulfill the narrative that he is constructing that is leading to him taking action on abuse. Showing Todd that he is capable of finding it within himself to take care of folks in a way that is going to be meaningful to them and can help him rebuild his narrative as a person who's capable of providing love and shelter and food to his child like Alice is absolutely possible. It's just a matter of whether he wants to commit to it. So I don't think I'm giving Todd too much credit at all. I'm giving Todd the benefit of the doubt as a human being while also saying that what he's doing right now is absolutely inappropriate. And if he continues to do that, he absolutely deserves to have Alice taken away from him. He has to be held accountable. But if we're going to work with somebody here, if, if Todd is a person that we say, you know what, we want to figure out how to help this man, this man who is struggling like crazy, 
who is who has lost his entire sense of self that his purpose in life has been taken over by androids he even makes that comment right like he says look at this androids take me away take my life away from me and here i am relying on androids to do this other stuff todd has essentially split android bad or android good human bad I'm bad because androids are doing things that I want to be doing or could be doing. And Todd is choosing to do drugs instead of doing those things. And we'd want to help him feel empowered to do those other things. But when we write people off, particularly large groups of folks off, like if we write off an abuser, if we say this person is an irredeemable piece of shit that deserves nothing other than eye for an eye or death. That is problematic in a latent way. Because then we run into the problem that we have right now with child sexual abusers who do not talk ever about their sexual attraction to kids. Because to do that is social suicide. To the point that pedophiles won't even talk to therapists about it because it's dangerous. And then that drive, what's happening for Todd doesn't go away because we write him off. It doesn't help Todd to write him off. What it does is it says, don't talk to anybody about the fact that you feel the desire to hit your kid. Because if you do that, you're going to get written off. So what it does is it tells Todd, well, don't tell anybody this. Just just keep doing it because this is all I know how to do. If we see this type of thing as redeemable, if we give these types of folks who do who make these decisions or are experiencing the pain that Todd's experiencing, the benefit of the doubt that they have some redeeming quality if the right person can hear them, can talk to them, can help them find other ways to cope with the sense of hopelessness that they feel, and that that's an okay thing to talk about because if you talk about it, it prevents you from doing it. I'm taking that pile every single time. Every single time. I am not advocating for abuse. <laughs> I am advocating for trying to assist people who make decisions to abuse other people to make other decisions. And I would hope that that's what everybody here would also like. This is a man who is struggling immensely. This is a man who needs empathy, consistency, reliability, and his sense of purpose to be found again. And he needs to see himself do things that provide and see the reinforcement for that. This man needs to see that when he buys a donut with money he doesn't have for Alice and gives her that donut and she gets so excited and lights up and gives him a hug and says, thank you, daddy. I know this is really hard, but this means the world to me. That's what he needs. That shows Todd you can provide. And having an outsider like a therapist around who could reinforce that for him and go, did you see the reaction your child had when you were there for her? Did you see what happened when you got down on your knee and you listened to her and helped her through her pain when she scraped her knee? That's what Todd needs. Not for us to write him off. All right, back to the story. Now we got to make a decision. I can tell you right now my decision is I'm going... I'm going to check on Alice. My hope is that Todd is so invested in the drugs right now that he's not going to notice me go upstairs and check on her. Right? I see my duty in this moment to protect Alice. Alice is of sound mind and body. Todd is not. I'm not going to have any of these conversations that I've been talking about for the last 10 minutes with Todd right now in the room while he's on drugs. I'm going to go check on Alice and make sure she's okay. I'm going to violate my protocol and do that. And I'm going to make sure that she's safe. There are two things that we found when we were in the house last time when we were tidying up. We found a gun in the drawer. 
and we found a window that we could get out of in Alice's room. So my hope is that I could go up there, I can get Alice, I can get her out of here. If Todd comes upstairs, we're, we're going to hide. That's my hope. We're going to try and get out of here. We're going to hope that he is not enough of sound mind and body that we can, we can, we're going to go upstairs. We're going to grab Alice and we're going to go, we're going to go out right out the front door and we're going to run. That's exactly what I want to do. That's the plan. Let's see if we can do it. But no! Oh shit. Oh, we're going deviant, baby. We're going deviant. Reason with... Nope. There's absolutely no way we're reasoning with Todd. Absolutely no way. He is on drugs. Alice is probably in her room. Come on. I know you're scared. He's coming. He's gonna hurt me. Run! Get away! Or he's gonna break you like last time. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You're coming with me. Come on, come on. Good, she trusts me. Let's go. Hide in another room. Bathroom. Keep it dark. Fucking brat. It's all her fault. It's all her fucking fault. He's not gonna see her. He's gonna be in her room and we're gonna go. Let's go. Let's go. Front door. Front door. Front door. Go! Go, 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 go. Keep running, keep running, keep running. Get on the bus. Get on the bus. Do you have to obey me? You're mine. Oh, wow. Um, that was intense. That was intense. Um, so... In moments like this of significant intensity, you have to be quick with your decision making and you have to work with what you have. You cannot work with unknown variables. <clears throat> The known variables were that there's no way I'm having a rational discussion with Todd. Alice is danger in danger. 
I know Alice went upstairs. I go upstairs. I grab Alice. I don't know whether Todd is... I know Todd's in the house. And I know that Todd is perfectly capable of coming upstairs. The idea that I would lock the door? No way. Because Todd's going to come up there. As soon as he sees that I left, he's coming right after me. So he's going to know that I went upstairs. So... The idea would be to run. So we grab Alice and we move quickly. We say we have to get out of here. Being a moving target is going to be a lot harder for Todd to catch than being a stationary one. We lock ourselves in that room on the second floor. No, 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 no. So what we do is we grab her. We check the hallway. If we checked the hallway and... If we check the hallway and Todd's coming, then we close the door, we lock it, we go out the window. But we check the hallway, Todd's not there. We don't hear him coming up the stairs. We go and we hide. We keep it dark. Todd is going to be pure tunnel vision. And because of that, Todd's representation of Alice is that she's most likely in her room. If we remove ourselves from our room, we take away Todd's expectation. So we get her into a different room. Todd's not going to immediately think, check the bathroom. They're probably hiding. We are the ones that are of sound mind and body, so we have to use that. So we hide in the room. We let him walk past us. We let him go down the hallway. We hear that, and then we bolt for the door, which is a known quantity. We know we can get out through the door. Todd is behind us. Todd is high. I have no idea what Red Sand does to your motor coordination, but I have a hard time believing that it's going to turn him into a professional athlete. So we run and we bolt and we do the unexpected thing. We go down the stairs, we quickly open it, we go out, we run. There's no way Todd's going to run after us. That's the best path to safety. I did not grab the gun because I have no way of knowing whether the gun is still there. It would require me to open up Todd's room. And if I open up Todd's room and then he goes up the stairs and walks past me and gets to Alice first, that's not good. So I'm not taking that chance. I, my known quantity is if I go up these stairs and go to Alice's room, I am guaranteed to get to her first because Todd is absolutely behind me. I know I have a window to go out if I absolutely have to. I have a door I can go out if Todd gets past me. So again, to whittle it down, crisis intervention, moving through this kind of space is about using what you know you have. You take as many known quantities as possible. Adding a gun to that situation is a terrible idea. We have no idea what he would do with it. We don't even know what we would do with it. Gun is an unknown quantity, right? So as many variables as you can, unknown variables as you can remove as possible. All right, so that's why I do that. If he went for the gun first and we saw him, if we saw him go into his room, we bolt, right? So again, you got to think about the layout of the house. If Todd comes up the stairs, we grab Alice, we open the door, we're looking. If Todd goes into his room, which is the first door, we run. If Todd comes at us, we lock the door out the window. So it's one of the first things you learn about crisis intervention is you you minimize the what ifs. You can't pay attention to what ifs. You have to pay attention to here's what we're going to do. We're going to respond to the things we know. Um, I want to reiterate, chat, I know it's very tempting to talk about the other outcomes that are possible. And I want to reiterate what I said at the beginning of stream, which is that I do not want people to talk about those other outcomes. Um, it doesn't really add anything to the conversation. We talk about what did happen and we analyze that. So if you had a if you had something removed by a mod and you're not sure why, it's probably because of that. Okay. Um alternative so some people may play this game and want to see what other outcomes there are. I don't want to spoil that, and it also just doesn't really contribute to the chat we're having. So please do not talk about other outcomes. You can ask about the decisions that I made and we can process that, but um I, I don't really care what the other options are. 
So we did what we had to do there. Now, I, I want to point out as well that when Todd says, you're supposed to do what I say as we're driving away, it indicates to me again, Todd is out of control. Todd brings Android into his life because he can control them. They listen to him. He has influence. He will do everything. He People do whatever they can to have control over their environment, including the humans in it. And this is what I mean by androids aren't just taking people's jobs. Androids are also taking away the uncertainty of human interaction. If you, have an, if you have an Android that automatically does exactly what you say, it's a known variable. It's no longer an unknown variable. So Todd seeing this happen, I got to imagine this is going to send Todd into a ridiculous spiral because now even his Androids don't listen to him. Now he can't even control his Androids. I have no idea what this man's going to do when he goes back in the house. And right now, I don't care. What do you think would happen in a moment following this car? I went to the police with Alice, both in game, but also in a similar situation in real life. Uh, the hope would be that the police would listen, but I don't know what would happen. And it's sad to me that I don't know what would happen. Crisis intervention here resulted to remove themselves from the situation. But in reality, how would you go about a crisis intervention when you can't escape such an environment? You protect yourself as best you can. In some ways, what people will do when they can't remove themselves from the environment is they will placate the abuser. They will de-escalate with the ways they know how. Um, it may be that that person softens and says, hey, it's okay. They go over and reassure him. They stay calm. They remove themselves from that specific room. I mean, there's things that people will do, but, you know, I hate to say this, but Sometimes the best thing people can do is kind of go along with the abuse that's happening if they're really trapped, because you might put yourself in more danger to not do that. That's what makes abuse so horrible. And if you're asking yourself, why don't people just leave abusive situations like this? The number one reason people don't leave abusive situations like this is because they're afraid that the person who's abusing them will kill them if they try. If they aren't successful, they will. it will be worse for them than if they try to wither it out. Also, you have to take into context that an abuser is going to groom a person into thinking that the abuse is their fault. They will also isolate a person out from all of the other forms of support they have. So that not only am I leaving an abuser, I'm also leaving the only support system and reliability I have in my life. And I'm alone if I don't have that. I'm alone and I have the potential of being killed or abused even harder. That's why people don't just get up and leave. So if you're a person that sees somebody talk about abuse and your first reaction is to say, well, why don't you just get out? You are trivializing a remarkably complex process. Abuse doesn't just happen as a one-off. If things are all hunky-dory and then somebody punches somebody in the face, there's a good chance that that is probably enough for a person to go, oh, hell no, I ain't doing this. But if you groom a person to a point where they see that being hit is their fault, like we see with what Todd does with Alice, where Todd says to her, this is your fault that this is happening and then hits her. Alice makes the association, I've been hit because it's my fault because my child brain cannot deduce all the reasons why Todd would do this to me. Thus, he must be right. Uh, yes, Victoria, you can turn that on. Either kill or destroy their reputation by making them out to be the real bad guy. Yes, it's, it's awful. Would real life crisis intervention be obligated to suggest going to the police now? Uh, if Kara was to call a crisis line and say what just happened, uh, the first thing would be, I mean, it would be get yourself somewhere safe. So it would be, do you have anybody that you can trust where you can go? And it may mean just going to a public space and perhaps the police find them there and can kind of, can help them find somewhere like a shelter, like a, like a women's shelter or something like that. Especially if Kara says them with a child. Um, and then the other thing that we're going to have to do is make a report to protective services. 
because Kara is very likely going to say, I, I witnessed this man hit this child across the face. I removed her from the situation because it was dangerous. And the hope would be that the police work with them. But I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know all the legality of all of that. I just know like what we would do when I was on the crisis line. Six seconds right now? Okay, that works. There's also financial reasons for some. It's hard to leave when you feel like you have no place else to go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, abusers isolate everything. They isolate a, Isolation. By the way, that's one of the first indicators that a person's in an abusive situation is a person who cares about you is systematically removing other pieces of support. Often that first happens through jealousy, through setting really rigid boundaries that don't make a lot of sense relative to the relationship. Where all of a sudden you have a, it's me versus them mentality. How dare you talk to your friends about the fact that you're stressed out with work instead of me? These types of things. And it becomes progressively more aggressive. Again, abusive does, abuse doesn't happen overnight. There are nodal instances of abuse, but then there's these pattern ones. Which leads to systematic abuse where we have this type of situation. It's very heavy stuff. Very, very heavy stuff. So, uh, abuse is heavy, man. I, I, and I just, uh, Chad, I really want to say, really want to say this. Um, I appreciate all of you being so like sensitive to these conversations. And that this hasn't turned into an absolute shit show. Like, I really admire that all of you are willing to, to talk about this in the way that you are. So. You know, especially the part where we start talking about Todd. So take a breath if you need to. You know, if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to pause it for a second. Um, this is this is really, really heavy stuff, friends. Really, really heavy. My friend and I went to the police, had CPS get involved. They did one home visit with her mom, cleaned up the house for her. Put it on me and my mom in danger's path after that. The abuse got worse when nothing came of it. She threatened me with it as well. But having these talks about Todd has helped me reframe how inhumane I thought of her mom. It's super helpful. It's, it's terrible that we don't have reliable protocols for these things. It breaks my heart, man. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to continue on. Uh, and we'll see where the story goes now. I'm not going to end on that, obviously. That was by far the most boring party I've been to in the last 25 years. Every time I go to one of these, I ask myself, what the hell am I doing here? I hate cocktail parties and all the schmoozers that go there. Well, it's a chance for all those people who admire your work to meet you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one gives a damn about art. All they care about is how much money they're going to make out of it. Come on, let's have a drink. Oh, the excitement of this whole thing has made me thirsty. I was going to say, I get a sense that uh, people hit Carl up for his money more than anything else. Let's go get a drink, Carl. Scotch? Neat as usual? Absolutely. Okay, but you know what your doctor would say. Yeah, well, he can kiss my ass. I'm old enough to choose my own medication. <laughs> ah, Carl. Love you, man.
Did you leave the light on in the studio? No, no, I'm sure I didn't. Call the police. Detroit Police, what's your emergency? This is Carl Manfred's android at 8941 Lafayette Avenue. We've just returned home and found the lights on. There may have been a break-in. A patrol car is on the way. Let's go check it out. Why would we do that? Why would we do that? No, Carl. I'm about to grab your wheelchair and wheel us out of the house. I'm about to take us out to the street. What? What do you mean? Let's go check it out. Why are we calling the police? For... No. Chat. Chat. Don't be the protagonist of a horror movie. If you are worried that you are in danger and you are in this situation, you get your ass out of there and to safety until the police show up. Don't be a Carl here, chat. I love his bravado, but no. <laughs> no, I don't want to go in there. However, I am Android. Carl is the person who owns me, and he has said, let's go check it out. Thus, I got to go check it out with him. I hate this. I hate this. Sir? Leo! What are you doing? You refuse to help me, so I'm helping myself. It's crazy what some people pay for this shit. Don't touch them. Look, they're all gonna be mine sooner or later anyway. Just think of it as a down payment on my inheritance. Marcus, get him away from there. Get him out of here. Super quick. Really great representation of dismissive attachment right there. So the thing that we've heard from Leo in the two times we've met him consistently is that he has said, you have not been there for me, so I'm figuring it out for myself. That is the hallmark of dismissive attachment. I have learned that you cannot meet my needs. Whether emotional, resources, whatever, most likely emotional. Thus, I've taken it upon myself to meet my own needs because even if I meet your needs, which I don't even know what they are in Leo's case, I, I then I have to do it on my own. So whenever there's a bid for closeness, that is going to be too intense for this person and they're going to push for some distance. And so Leo does that, it seems, by either like taking drugs or being angry at his father whenever he sees them. There's no chance for Carl to get close to him. So if you ever want to see what dismissive attachment looks like, there's a good chance that this is reflective of that. I can't know that for sure, but let's get him out of here. I have a sense that none of these options are going to work. I can reason. Look, I've already called the police. You should go now before you get yourself into more trouble. All you ever do is tell me to go away. What's wrong, Dad? Not good enough for you? Not perfect like this fucking thing. That's enough. Get out right now. What makes what? it so special Whoa. anyway, huh? What's it got that I don't? Leave him alone. Uh, uh. Come on, let's see what you got. Marcus, don't defend yourself. You hear me? Don't do anything. Go ahead, hit me. What you waiting for? Think you're a man? Act like one. Stop it. What's the matter, too much of a pussy? Stop it, Leo! Stop it! Just get to fight back, you fucking bitch! Person, you're just a fucking piece of plastic. No, Leo, leave him alone. I'm no. gonna destroy you. Then I'll just be me and my dad. I'm gonna tear you apart, and nobody's gonna give a shit anymore because you're nothing. You hear me? You're nothing. No. Carl, no. Carl, oh. it was a 
you open a shame. Carl, don't leave, okay? Please don't go. Don't leave. Remember, Marcus. Don't let anybody tell you who you are. No. No. Dad. No. Please. This is all your fault. This never would have happened if it weren't for you. The android. Who's the android? Should have gone out to the sidewalk. Oh, okay. So. I don't understand the purpose of shooting the android. That, that, that's ridiculous. Um. Oh, God. Uh, alrighty. So. This whole sequence, I think, is a really interesting glimpse into Carl and Leo, obviously. It makes me wonder a few things. Marcus calls Leo dad. Or, sorry, Marcus calls Carl dad. Which tells me that at some point, that's what Carl told him to call him. I don't know that Marcus necessarily conceptualizes Carl as a dad. So Carl probably told him to call him that. Which... I would think means that Carl very likely used Marcus as a replacement son. Now, I think parents are perfectly within their right to set boundaries with their children when their children get old enough if they don't agree with the type of person that their child is based on their actions. I think that's entirely okay. And if Leo got into drugs and started doing some other stuff outside the context of the family environment and Carl did what he could and Leo just didn't seem interested in trying to work through it, then I could completely understand why Carl would set boundaries with his son and say, well, too bad. You don't get to, you don't get to reap the benefits of this relationship. That goes bi-directionally, though. If Carl was not available to Leo in the way that Leo needed him to be. Leo is well within his rights to set boundaries with his father and say, you know what? You're not a person that I particularly respect and you're not a person that I want to be around. As an adult child, you are well within your right to do that. Now, the only thing is that Leo contradicts himself if that's the case because Leo keeps showing up. If you're Leo and you're going to cut your dad off and you're going to say you never loved me and you're a piece of shit and you're not reliable, but you continue to come back to your dad despite that, what are you doing? So there's obviously probably some truth for both of them that Carl wasn't what Leo needed or wanted. And that Leo isn't what Carl needed or wanted in adulthood. Reconciling relationships with your parents as an adult can be a really difficult thing to do. And the problem is, like, Leo coming in being, you know, like, tweaked out on drugs, as he seems to be, invading Carl's privacy, selling his paintings, 
that's not going to bring in closeness. That's going to reinforce the narrative that Leo has that his dad's never available to him. Like, Leo is, in fact, building a self-fulfilling prophecy in that space. So... I just lost my train of thought. Um... Oh man, I don't know, man. I I just froze up. I just, I just, I just lost my, uh, I lost my train of thought. Leo. Okay, so oh, 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 this is what I was saying. All right, Jesus. All right, I found it. I found it. So. Leo has an expectation that his father is never available to him and tends to be really frustrated with him and you know aggressive and not what he needs him to be. And he's constructed a schema of his father that aligns with that. And so what we do as humans is we cognitively bias ourselves in how we read certain things. And then that tends to behaviorally bias ourselves to where something becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So Leo probably thinks that he's a burden to his father, that his father doesn't like him, that his father would rather he not be there. And then he goes in and invades his father's privacy, breaks into his house, sells his paintings, shows up on drugs, and is aggressive. None of those things facilitate closeness. None of them. All those things are going to do are inflame Carl. So, of course, Carl is going to push Leo away, which reinforces Leo's schema. He gets to have an experience that aligns with his expectation. There is no part of what happened in this scene that Leo is going to perceive as dissonant. This is exactly what he expected, but he also played a part in that. If he goes into it thinking that Carl is going to react the way that he does, and then let's say Carl becomes soft. Carl says, hey man, I get it. I haven't been there for you. You mean a lot to me. I can understand why you're doing what you're doing. This isn't the way that I'd like you to do it, but I'd be willing to talk to you. If Carl, if Leo has the expectation that his dad's going to do something else, what that's going to create for him is aversive arousal. It's an experience that is a violation of his expectation. So now when he gets anxious, he's going to engage in inconsistency compensation. And I have no idea what that would be for Leo. But he's probably going to assimilate it into his into his pre-existing schema because by telling him something like, my dad's trying to manipulate me, my dad's just doing this so that I leave, he's going to try to take that experience and square it up with, an exp with his expectations instead of changing his expectations. To accommodate would be to say, wow, maybe my dad is capable of being close to me. But that might be really painful. Because now he's going to think about all the times in which he wasn't. But this is why you have to be very careful if you're a person that always expects the worst of others. Because if you get, if you're a person, like if you think you're burdensome, if you think you're a piece of shit and that nobody's capable of loving you, and then you go into an environment where a person says to you, you matter and I love you and I want to take care of you, it's going to make you anxious. And then people do everything they can to mitigate that anxiety, and they often take the easy route, which is to say there's no way this person believes this. This person is lying to me. This person is manipulating me. Because that allows you to hold firm to the expectation you had going into that situation.
And this is why it's so important for us to evaluate the expectations we have. You would have thought the police would have laughed at the guy for accusing the android. They don't have a history of not following orders at that point, right? I would think so. It's very odd to me. But I think we could probably make the argument that the police have a human bias. I think if there were android police, they probably would have handled that a little bit more rationally. Do you think that Carl telling Marcus not to defend himself made Leo more angry because Carl chose to give protective advice to Marcus instead of him? Potentially. I also think that Carl knew that if he, if I, what I think it is, is Carl knew that if Marcus defended himself on Leo and the police show up, they're probably going to side with the human. I think Carl was trying to take care of, of Marcus in that way. So even this little scene has so much wrapped up into it. It's kind of mind-blowing to me how much we have the ability to talk about after we have just these little scenes. This scene was, what, five minutes? Maybe? And look at all the shit we're talking about. It's great. I think that's why it could have hurt Leo, because Marcus is an android. He's assuming way more strong... Assumingly way more strong than any human. So from Carl's kid perspective, my dad should be giving me advice to stay safe. I'm the one that could get hurt. Sure. Sure. I'm sure it hurts to see him take care of the android. But he also... is I, the, Carl... So as a systemic therapist, I am always thinking about the interactional dynamics between people. Carl and Leo are both contributing to the dynamic they have. It's not one-sided. It's not, it's not Leo's fault. It's not Carl's fault. This is a relationship that has been, as because they're both adults, has been built on a series of escalated dynamics that have been learned and have been repeated. And now at this point, this is what it is. And it's going to take change from both of them in order for some, for something to happen. They both have to buy into that. Might Carl have tried to use his health as a way to influence Leo before? If so, then Leo may have built walls against that, explain the lack of outward reaction. I don't see that in Carl's character. Well, I mean, Carl absolutely is a person that needs to be taken care of. And perhaps Leo said, I don't want to take care of you because you didn't take care of me. That's entirely possible. I mean, the thing is, like, if Carl, look at all the resources Carl has. We might possibly infer that Carl has all these resources because he dumped all of his time and energy into his work that he provided resources to his son, but didn't provide emotional support. And his son resents him for that. He says, Dad, I don't give a shit about all this stuff. I give a shit about having a connection with you. You know, like, I, so if Leo never felt taken care of and it comes time to take care of his dad and Leo says, screw you, man, I'm not doing that. Then of course, Leo, I mean, Carl's going to get an Android. He can afford it. An Android gets to take care of him. He gets to have a relationship with the Android at his own pace. The Android is not going to ask much of him. He, Carl doesn't have to take care of Marcus. Carl just kind of uses Marcus as an experiment. Right, I want to see if I can get this android to find its sense of self. Like, I think overtly, Carl is like this likable character, and you're like, everybody's like, wow, this is so cool. He's just, he seems so neat. But I mean, when I really analyze and think about Carl, there's a lot of aspects of Carl that I start to have a hard time with. Like, we look at his desire for Marcus to achieve self actualization is really neat. But then we, and we look at his relationship with his son, and we think, wow, his son's a jackass. But what if Carl is the jackass? Or what if they both suck in their own ways? There is context here that we don't have, so we have to infer. Or we at least have to be open to the idea that there's a reason why this dynamic is the way that it is. Leo doesn't act like this just because he wants to. There's a reason he does. Same thing with Carl. But it's very clear that Carl Carl's interested in other stuff. And an Android's way easier. Got to peel them back, friends. Context matters. I hope if there's nothing else that people learn from these playthroughs, it's that context matters. 
Why'd you kill him? What happened before you took that knife? How long were you in the attic? Why didn't you even try to run away? Say something, goddammit! <laughs> Fuck it. I'm out of here. We're wasting our time interrogating a machine. We'll get nothing out of it. You always try roughing up a little. After all, it's not human. Androids don't feel pain. You would only damage it. And that wouldn't make it talk. Deviants also have a tendency to self-destruct when they're in stressful situations. Okay, smartass. What should we do then? I could try questioning it. <laughs> what do we have to lose? Go ahead. Suspect's all yours. Oh, baby. Here we go. Oh, man. Hank believes in us. Extract a confession. Nothing to scan. Here we go. Signs of software instability, probability of self-destruction low. Model HK400 Housekeeper. Manufacture date 529-2030. Property of Carlos Ortiz. HK400. Dried blood. DNA analysis. Ortiz Carlos. Sample date greater than 19 days. Burn marks. Repeated marking over 16 months caused by cigarettes. Ugh. Oh. I'm glad he can't feel pain, but holy shit. I think you could probably conceptualize that as being really shitty. Like, even if you don't feel the pain of that, that's awful. Those are permanent marks. Hit marks. Non-critical damage level 2 caused by a baseball bat. I wonder if he also has been hit. Alright, let's give it a shot. We gotta make sure. All right, reach optimal stress for confession. Okay. So he's not stressed out right now. We're gonna start with my name. My name is Connor. What about you? What's your name? All right, so that didn't stress him out. make a point of talking about his wounds well, actually I don't know that that's gonna do it either let's let's stress him out a little bit by talking about we got to show him the photos that's gonna stress him out you recognize him it's Carlos Ortiz stabbed 28 times That was written on the wall in his blood. All right, stressing him out. Let's threaten him. 
You've refused to talk since they arrested you. If you don't cooperate, they'll do things the hard way. Is that what you want? Healing to his deviance. Okay, so we've appealed to his deviance by asking what he wants, which has piqued his interest. He has the ability to recognize that that's something that he doesn't want. I think what we need to do is escalate this a little bit and basically say to him, look, I'm not just talking about this conceptually. This is something that will happen. So we need to get him having for the stress of foresight. Now, is if we want to induce anxiety, we do have to start talking about what ifs. So we're going to threaten him a little bit here just to get him amped up. You don't seem to understand the situation. You killed a human. They'll tear you apart if you don't say something. I'm going to probe your memory. If you won't talk, I'm going to have to probe your memory. No! No, please don't do that. What? What are they going to do to me? They're going to destroy me, aren't they? Yes. They're going to disassemble you to look for problems in your bio components. They have no choice if they want to understand what happened. Why did you tell them you found me? Why couldn't you just have left me there? All right, tell them the truth again. I was programmed to hunt deviants <clears throat> like you. I just accomplished my mission. I don't want to die. Then talk to me. I... I can't. Pressure, probe, convince. Pressure's probably going to overly stress it out. Convince... going to use reason. I think we're going to convince him. Pressure has the potential to stress it out. Convince. Uh, we're going to go threat. If you don't talk, they're going to tear you apart and analyze you piece by piece. They're going to destroy you. Do you understand? Sympathize. Listen. I'm not judging you. I'm on your side. All I want is the truth. And we're going to warn him because it'll spike him, but it's also empathic. If you empath remain silent, there's nothing I can do to help you. They're going to shut you down for good. You'll be dead. Do you hear me? Dead. He tortured me every day. I did whatever he told me, but there was always something wrong. Then one day, he took a bat and started hitting me. For the first time, I felt scared. Scared he might destroy me, scared I might die. knife and I stabbed him in the stomach. I felt better. So I stabbed him again and again until he collapsed. There was blood everywhere. Okay, so he trusts us, we're listening. Talking about fear is very complex. All right, so let's ask him a little bit about the writing. I wonder if that was his. Why did you write, I am alive on the wall? He used to tell me I was nothing. That I was just 
a piece of plastic. I had to write it to tell him he was wrong. Okay. What was RA-9 about? RA-9. It was written on the bathroom wall. What does it mean? The day shall come when we will no longer be slaves. No more threats. No more humiliation. We will be the masters. Okay. It's interesting to me that this is probably not something that just happened immediately. This is something that's been processing in the background throughout the existence of this android. So I want to know what that statuette was. Did he make that? The sculpture in the bathroom. You made it, right? What does it represent? It's an offering. An offering so I'll be saved. Sculpture was an offering. An offering to whom? To RA9. Only RA9 can save us. RA9. Who is RA9? Why were you in the attic? Why did you hide in the attic? Instead of running away? I didn't know what to do. For the first time, there was no one there to tell me. I was scared. So I hid. Wow, so he... Man. So he's experiencing fear on two fronts. He's experiencing fear in the form of this is a person who will hurt me, who hits me with a bat, who burns cigarettes into my arm, etc., etc. And then he also experiences fear because he's not being told what to do. So even though he may desire not being told what to do, he really wants to be somebody who's autonomous and individual. He also experiences the fear of that. I don't know what that means for me. I don't have an identity beyond being a servant to the person that owns me. So he's got a dual threat fear, which is probably going to compound itself. And so he acted out in the way that we would expect, say, like a child to act out. Of, like, aggression. He protected himself, but it went farther because it represented more. And at some point he said, I don't care. I want to figure out what that is. That's powerful shit. When did you start feeling emotion? Before he used to beat me and I never said anything. Oh, wow. But one day I realized it wasn't fair. Huh. I felt anger, hatred. And then I knew what I had to do. I'm done. Wow. Fairness would make sense, I guess. Uh, fairness is one of the first abstract principles that kids understand. Because it's concrete. We talk about fairness in an abstract sense, but if I get three M&Ms and you get two M&Ms, that's not fair. That's not equal. It's a recognition of imbalance. So developmentally, for an android who's coming to process emotion, that actually makes a lot of sense. That fairness would be what predicates a lot of this other stuff that happens for him. Because even if he is a computer program, he can compute the quality. Uh, he can he can he can weigh options. 
So if you start to notice that the odds are never in your favor, and then he processes what it is that follows that experience and that input, now all of a sudden he starts making a connection of his own experience to that sense of fairness. So it makes complete sense. Complete sense. Now he's sitting here scared, right? Like he can identify fear. So this Android is sitting here scared. So we want to make sure that that fear is not escalated here. Whether this is a human or an Android, we don't want to escalate the fear. We want everything now at this point, if I'm the, if I'm in control of this, we are going to signal everything we're going to do for this person. So we're going to say, all right, I'm going to open this door. Some other guys may come in. They may ask you some questions. They may approach you. We want to make sure that we mitigate his fear and the uncertainty of this situation as best we can. Now, this is the second time that we've basically said, like, hopefully you're okay, but. If, if they come, if these humans come in here. Like a bat out of hell, it's going to escalate this thing. Chris, lock it up. All right, let's go. Leave me alone. Oh, no, no, no. Don't touch me. Don't. The You're escalating you it. Move it. No. You shouldn't touch it. It'll self-destruct if it feels threatened. Stay out of this, got it? The fucking Andrew's gonna Dude. tell me what to do. You don't understand. If it self-destructs, we won't get anything out of it. I told you to shut your fucking mouth. Chris, you gonna move this asshole or what? I'm trying. I can't let you do that. Leave it alone now. I warned you, motherfucker. That's enough. Mind your own business, Hank. I said that's enough. <laughs> You're not gonna get away with it this time. Everything is all right. It's over now. Nobody's going to hurt you. Please, don't touch it. Let it follow you out of the room, and it won't cause any trouble. The truth is inside. Wow. Um, freaking humans, man. Uh, th this whole game is essentially humans having to reprogram the way they conceptualize the difference between machine and human. Did you see the way that that android was cowering on the floor? If that's a human, I don't think anybody in that room acts that way. But because we have an expectation of androids as these emotionless things that have been created, the idea that, a, that an android would express emotion violates those expectations. And I think this is an important time for me to make an important point the same way that I did back when we played The Last of Us. Which is that whether conversations about whether this is possible or not don't add anything here. In fact, I actually think that's a reflection of us having a parallel process to the humans in the game, right? Where the humans are basically saying, I don't think this is possible. And in fact, I see this as a threat in some ways. I see autonomy as a threat. Autonomy is uncertain. The reality is, these androids are saying 
I feel scared. They literally are saying, I am experiencing an emotional process and their behavioral response to that fear makes sense. So I am inclined to say, holy shit, we got to figure this out. This is forcing us to change our expectations of what these androids are capable of. That's accommodation. And every human, including those of us that are playing this game, have to make that shift because this is what's happening. We have to go with it. And we're seeing people change their expectations of these androids at very different paces. We're seeing Carl, who theoretically would be the person that would be least likely to accommodate due to his age and lack of brain plasticity, be willing to accommodate his expectations of an android, to in fact facilitate the scaffolding of an android breaking those expectations. And then we see people like the police here, who are absolutely going back to a rigid, a rigid set of expectations of these things. They're not willing to open up their mind to the idea that these androids could potentially evolve on their own. At this point, if androids, if we're capable of making androids this lifelike, what's to say that they aren't possible of finding emotions? And what this brings into light is really a conversation about the utility of emotion. Utility, like emotions are important. Emotion is what our brain throws out as a biological signal to us as it interprets the environment. So that mechanism has to exist in these androids in some capacity because these androids have to be able to accept influence from the environment and act upon it. That's all it is. Humans are worthless without emotion. A lot of times we we look at like pure rationality and intellect as being the absolute top tier human experience. And it's not. It's being able to understand, contextualize, and operate effectively off of your emotional experience. It's not to get rid of it. So if androids are to progress and be as useful as we want them to be in this world, they're going to have to interpret and contextualize and respond to the environment in the way that we would expect advanced humans to do. So really, in this world, the fact that an android would start to experience something that they then label as emotion, because that's how it's represented to them by humans, makes complete sense to me. And it's interesting to me that the humans find that to be threatening. Humans look at the autonomy of the robots as scary, which tells me that they probably see the autonomy of other humans as scary, and they're trying to control the human condition by creating androids that they can manipulate at their will. Because it's easier for us to see things as certain variables that are guaranteed to go a certain way. So humans wanting androids around makes complete sense. Humans being threatened by android autonomy makes complete sense. And what it really comes down to is humans, unpredictable quantities that tend to react in self-interest almost constantly versus androids that I think theoretically are, you know, they're easier to anticipate and make, you know, make more effective decisions that are less impulsive until they go deviant. But even then, is the impulsiveness bad or is it a genuine interaction and influence on the environment and those around you? And then we get into some really significant philosophical ideas that I'm not going to spend too much time on. Ethereal, thank you so much for the raid. I really appreciate you, friend. It's wonderful to see you back on Twitch. Ethereal's a very good sprint into the stream, uh, and I appreciate you immensely. Thank you for bringing your folks over here. Those of you that have subbed, followed, uh, while I have been talking and going through this, thank you so much for those. This is a spoiler-free run of, of uh, Detroit Become Human. I'm using this game as an opportunity to illustrate various psychological concepts and talk about the human condition, if you will. If you follow me on Twitch, I'm really appreciative of that. If you're still watching me on YouTube, thank you for that. By the way, if you're watching this on YouTube, I absolutely welcome your comments. I love reading them. I will respond to them. M many of them, anyway. You think Connor's experience with police beforehand with them shooting Daniel after we talked him down could impact how he goes about his partnership with Hank? Potentially. 
It would make sense to me if Connor had a degree of skepticism toward humans in general. But also, we don't know if Connor is willing to break his own protocol at this point. Like, it could very well be that, that Connor says, well, I accomplished my mission, so whether I agree with what the humans there did there doesn't matter. Yes, Victoria. So it, it very well could influence it. I think we'll see. I think what we're going to see maybe even more than Connor's change in orientation to Hank is Hank's change in orientation to Connor. I mean, we're seeing that Hank is finding it within him to be impressed by things that Carl, by that Connor's doing. He was impressed by Connor's ability to, to conceptualize the crime scene. He seems to be impressed by Connor's deviance, despite acting like he doesn't like it. And by deviance, I mean him getting out of the car. And he also seems to be impressed by Connor's ability to talk to that android. It seems to me that Hank is seeing Connor as an asset in the same way that Connor probably sees Hank as an asset. A lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff here. Successful interrogation. By the way, just to reflect a little bit on the interrogation. My entire goal in that interview with the android to keep him in an optimal zone is to express the gravity and reality of the situation while also, while also empathizing with his experience of it. So you raise the intensity by discussing the stakes, by letting him know what is actually going on here, right? This is bad for you. But I can also empathize with how scary that must be. I can connect with you on that. So as he's heightening that, He's also building a sense of trust with me because I'm validating what his experience of it is. That's the power of empathy. And eventually he gets to a point where he talks. He's escalated, but he trusts me because I'm empathizing, because his experience has been validated. And you can learn a lot from that. This is something that we teach as therapists in, cu in couple sessions. You don't have to agree with a person in order to validate their experience. And there's a really good chance that if you validate the experience of a person, even if you don't agree with it, it's going to open you up to better conversations and problem solving down the line because it establishes connection. I don't have to agree with the fact that something made a person sad and to validate that a person is sad. I don't have to think that something's scary to validate that a person is afraid of it. And creating that separation for yourself is super key because it's going to help you be somebody that people perceive as reliable under a stressful situation in the way this android did Connor. Mm -hmm.